Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining in. It means a lot to us that you've chosen to spend your Sunday evening with us. Well, Sundays in general are very, very sacred, aren't they? Whether it's lockdown time or not. You must really love the sound of our voices and so you keep coming back Sunday after Sunday. I'm joking. I know this has nothing to do with IDEX Legal or the Grey Matter. It does have a lot to do with our guest today, who is, well, a very, very accomplished lawyer. He's been a practicing counsel for over four and a half decades. He is a designated senior counsel. I'm told he's a magician in the courtrooms because every time he walks in, he casts quite the spell. Well, I don't want to waste too much more time. I'm going to make my last line of introduction. I'm told he's very gentle, suave, humble and kind. He's definitely kind because he's been kind enough to humor us and get onto this show and agree to get well unsuited. So without further ado, presenting Mr. Janak Dwarkadas. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Thanks for being Good with evening. us. And Thank I'm going to have you inviting me and hello, everybody. Hi, I'm handing this over to Vikas Vich, my colleague and friend, who's going to pick it up from here and start off with our first segment, which we have very innovatively called the interview. So Vikas, over to you. Super. Thank you so much, Tanisha. And thank you, sir, for uh, being the second guest on our show, The Unsuited. Um, it's my pleasure. Great. So let, let's go back. A couple of years, now go back to your childhood and the, the journey of uh, becoming a lawyer. Because you, you mentioned many times that you were a shy and reticent when you were a child. Um, so how do you go from that to becoming a counsel, which demands a whole different you know, skill set? And it's a very different ball game for someone who's shy and reticent. Okay. Could you, could you repeat the last part? I didn't get it. Yeah, it's very much how did you, as a shy, reticent person or child, end up joining the law and especially um, starting a career in council? Oh, well, it's a long story. It's very difficult to compress four decades of your life. But uh, since you started at the beginning, uh, yes, I was extremely shy and a very reticent child and I never uh, in my school or college days took part in any uh, dramatics or elocution or any, for any form of activity where the limelight would be on me. So it was, of course, a huge transformation to become an arguing counsel as I became later. But if you ask me what changed along the way, I would say that there were two or three things which, uh, which uh, in that sense uh, made the difference. The first, of course, being that being a child born and raised in a family of lawyers, uh, without your really, you're realizing it, you are imbibing to some extent the law. It's like being born in the family of musicians where, you know, un unknowingly you are exposed to it. And so there were a lot of law books around the place. My father was a counsel practicing. My grand uncle was a very successful solicitor. My uncle was a successful solicitor. The law being discussed all the time. And so in that sense, I was already exposed without real realizing it in my younger days. But, uh, but during my schooling, uh, I, I, it was almost like a pattern that every report card for whether it was a terminal exam or a final exam would have a red ink remark from this class teacher as well as the principal to say <laughs> very shy needs to speak up does not participate poor language skills etc etc and, and you know there was not much changing as we as I went along but somewhere around uh, the seventh or eighth grade my father realizing that uh, I really needed to do something to, if I, if I, if I wanted to be successful, because nobody knew what I would be doing, but he felt that it was important that I should get a private tutor. And in those days, there used to be a Parsi gentleman. And again, hats off to the Parsi community. They are the, probably the most dedicated people that I've come across. And I can say that 
after being in the profession, a lot of my friends are Parsis and I'm very, very grateful to them for the encouragement and in the dedication that they have displayed. So this gentleman was an elderly gentleman. He was a retired teacher and he took it upon himself that he was going to change me. Why I do not know, but I'm grateful eternally for that because he used to come home and he would be home before I returned from school because my grand uncle had a huge library of some 3000 books and wow. he would be reading because the books would be, I mean, there was anything and everything under the sun in that library from poetry to plays of the year to, to literature to, to you name it. I mean, history of the world and photography and whatever it, you could ask for, it was all there. And he was so immersed in short stories and, and Bertrand Russell and George Bernard Shaw and Shakespeare, the collected works. And he, as soon as I came home, there was no formal teaching. It was not as if you would sit me down and say, okay, let me see what you did for in school today. You'd just be reading a book and start immediately, as soon as I sat down, read loudly a passage from, say, Shakespeare or Bernard Shaw. And you just explain the deeper meaning of the words. It was a very informal kind of teaching where he actually made me develop the love for the language. Till then, I never realized that English could be such a beautiful a language in which you could express yourself in so many different ways. You pick out a book of poetry and just start randomly reading a poem and tell me all about its deeper meaning and explain it to me. So that was one huge turning point because it suddenly, I think, in a, in a, again, in a very unknowing way and without a formal teaching method, it improved my language skill, skills. And uh, I, I showed that in my, in my results. And uh, ultimately, I, I did very well in my senior Cambridge exam. And uh, after that, there were the other big change that took place was that my father insisted that I do a course on public speaking at the Indo-American Society because of the shyness that I had and reticence to stand up in public. So that made another huge change because it, it kind of made me aware that when you did get up on stage, the nervousness actually disappeared. In my case, I mean, I don't know, I cannot say about everybody, but in my case, I found that it was only a matter of getting up there. And that's what made the huge change. And the last thing, of course, was thanks to a friend of mine who actually uh, is no longer in India, he's in, 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 in London, but he actually took me along with him to uh, hear Ram Jethmalani argue in court. And he also took me to one of the lectures of Nani Palkiwala on the budget. And those two left a very deep impression on me. And finally, when it came to the crunch, uh, contrary to all that I had been proclaiming, proclaiming to my father that I, one thing I'll never be is a lawyer, I ended up <laughs> in the profession. So that's the story. And uh, I wasn't very nervous when I, when I did finally get up to argue. Uh, as indeed in the beginning I used to feel. I have that's just one question. Story. That's a, that's, yeah, that's a lot of yeah. stories woven into one. Thank you. But I have one question. Did you, Mr. Dwarkadas, uh, go back to any of your school teachers or the principal and say, hey, look what I made of myself now. <laughs> Did you do that? Uh, not really. I, I lost all contact with my school for some reason. And but when we completed 40 years uh, of leaving the school, we had a kind of a reunion, a class reunion, and we met some of our teachers. And obviously, by then they had heard, you know, about me. And so it was, you know, it was a different kind of reunion for me from the time I used to run away from them in school. So <laughs> it, it was interesting. It was very. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Which, where did you school at now that you've talked about your school so much? Uh, my school was Campion. You went to Campion. Okay, super. Thank you. It's actually also um, a very inspiring story for 
young kids today as well. So um, to know that, you know, you can be shy, reticent, and not know, you know, and, and having a, maybe a fear of, you know, public speaking when you were younger before the work that your you know, private tutor, your grandfather did with you. It's very inspiring for even parents to say, look, even with this kind of, you know, reticence and shyness, you could still make it if you get the right coaching and the right support. There's no reason you still can't make it as a great lawyer, great public speaker. You can't overcome those fears. But also very inspiring from that front as well. Yes, uh, that's true. I, I think uh, it should be a lesson for all parents, uh, if I may say that, and probably even for people who who joined the profession or who are trying to find their feet in the profession, that it's it's not all that, you know, it's, it's from a distance, it looks very daunting, if I may put it that way, and it may appear to be beyond your capacity but but it's it's not it's not all that fearful as it looks. It just requires you to pick up courage and and uh, train yourself. The main thing is to train yourself, and I think you can do it. Yeah. And how old were you when you made your first public appearance? Then the first public, you know, on stage when you said you you spoke for the first time. How old were you then? Well. I mean, the first ever appearance I made in court was within, it was in court, of course, and uh, in, in, if, if that's a public appearance, because be, before that, the only time I must have got any kind of exposure to the limelight would be in the privacy of a moot court in, in law college, because in those days, moot courts or, or mock courts were not as rigidly, uh, they were not as compulsory and they were not as rigidly followed as they are now. So I did get some exposure of having to argue a case in a, in a mock court in government law, but that was only one instance. Thereafter, mm -hmm. the first ever appearance in court was in court, and and mm -hmm. it was a very short uh, matter of court. In fact, it was an adjournment brief. But, you know, in those days, we were always told that whether it's an adjournment brief or whatever brief, you have to read it up. You have to know all the facts. The court would expect you and could ask you questions, and you ought to therefore read up the brief. So <laughs> it was the first time ever I read what was called a brief, and uh, and went there <laughs> pretty well prepared. And of course, uh, that as I said, the nervousness is there before you get up, but once yeah. you open your mouth, it, it became it wasn't it, it wasn't all that bad. So. I felt very good after that. That's fantastic. And what was your first appearance? Do you remember that case? Yeah, uh, I can't. I can't remember that case. But it was. I remember the courtroom in which I appeared, and luckily it was before a very, very kind judge, Justice Mehta, and it was courtroom number two on the ground floor of the High Court. And wow. as I said, it was only a brief to go and apply for an adjournment. But uh, the judge was very kind. He probably, you know, he was kind to juniors generally, not to me alone. <laughs> so it was, it was. I was fortunate that he treated me with uh, kids' gloves, if I may put it that way, and gave me the opportunity to speak, knowing probably that it was the first time. So I think the judges know, by and large, you know, who's who's a newcomer and who's who's a veteran. Yeah, and just on that point, like you were saying. The judge was very good at kind of uh, spotting that you were new and you know not going too hard on you and supporting you. Um, you've also helped, you know, you've had a book authored on your family. So it'd be great to understand this role of mentors and who you, who you would consider uh, the member in your family that most influenced you in those early years. Oh, uh, well, I. I got the book authored by uh, a friend of, uh, I mean, the wife of my one of my juniors, uh, Sifra Lenton. She is a known historian. She is uh, she is uh, authored quite a few books, and I had broached the subject with her, and I told her that look, uh, I never realized till some publisher from Delhi called me up one day out of the blue, and asked me if if 
one of my grand uncles used to be a freedom fighter and had written a book of his uh, struggles during the uh, freedom fight and his association with nehru and gandhi ji and all that and he said do you know if your grand uncle jamuna das dwarka das came out with the second edition of his so and so book and i had absolutely no clue i didn't know what he was talking about in the sense about the fact that he had he had he was to write a second book etc and uh, so that the he had a very deep association with gandhi ji so i had heard was you know as a child growing up and we used to meet my family uh, different members and i i gathered that they had played a big role but i never realized how important a role they had played or what how significant a role they had played and i had my grandfather who had six brothers and my great grandfather in that sense uh, there used to be a joke in my family that uh, if somebody was asked who are which are the seven wonders of the world then one of my uncles used to say it's dwarka das dharam si my great grandfather and his six children and that would please the whole lot of them and they would have a merry cackle about being to call the seven wonders of the world but uh, you know all this came back to me suddenly when this publisher from delhi called up and asked for this uh, second edition and then i made my inquiries and i found that there didn't appear to be a book like that so on, on that sort of that thought rankled in my mind for quite a long time before i picked up the phone and i asked sifra lenchin that could if he could help me you know uh, write a book which i wanted to write more because i wanted the generation that is going to grow up after me and was mm. not exposed like my children my nephews my nieces my grandchildren who were not exposed to the family because they they all grown up in nuclear families to get to know their pedigree and you know where they came come from so sifra said that would be a great idea and that she told me that look the best way to go about it is to get hold of two qualified research scholars and you will be amazed how much material there will be on your family in the archive and i honestly never ever believe what she told me till those two girls we engage i mean they i had the amount of material they gathered from the archives i was shocked and it it was an eye opener for me uh, as a member of the family to discover the kind of stuff that my great grandfather had 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 you know uh, contributed and done for the for the community for the growth of bombay being having been a sheriff at one time the role he played in the trial of tilak and how he stood uh, you know uh, bail for him and and he participated in the trial and so many things of the the house that the houses that he had built and which still even today two of them still stand at flora fountain i happened to visit them then and even later and uh, my grand uncles and the freedom struggle and the fight and the closeness to gandhi ji and particularly jamuna das who i mentioned earlier he, there are two uh, statements which of of his which i'll never forget and in both he kind of chides gandhi ji one is on the swaraj movement where uh, gandhi ji is, is is promoting you know people to to stand up to the british and to to strike against the british etc and he said if you are going to encourage people to stand up against the establishment and to go on strikes for every little thing as in when we get independence this will get seeped into their system and you will find that they will do the same thing when we have got self rule and we are in power and that seems to be happening even 70 years or 75 years later as we can mm-hmm. see and the other thing he 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 kind of disagreed with gandhi ji on was this call for prayer all the time and he says well prayer is such a private and personal thing you don't please make you know people join you in prayer and worship because it will make them lazy they will think that you know they don't need to work 
prayer is the answer and now you can see how true those words were you know where you can't forsake uh, work for religious activity or for you know all these so th I, i think that was a interesting uh, thing i discovered and this is all in the archives whatever i'm saying i didn't know about it it was discovered yeah. through the archives but the person who influenced me the most as, as a child growing up was my grand uncle trikamdas who used to be a solicitor senior partner of a law firm called kanga and company he was virtually the founder and i happened to be his favorite uh, grand nephew and and a pet of his and again as i said i didn't know but i grew up amongst law books and lawyers so i used to visit him at his office uh, at ready money mansion at flora fountain virtually every saturday he would insist that i go there he would take me to his favorite shop and i could buy whatever i wanted like <laughs> chocolates and this and whatever you know it was up to me what i wanted and he spoiled yeah. me silly but he was very very successful he had some of the best clients that anybody could ask for like maharajas and industrialists and whoever you know you could name them businessmen and it would it would i would see what success meant i saw what success meant first hand because every new year's day that is a new year according to the hindu calendar from 7 in the morning and this is not an exaggeration from 7 in the morning to 7 in the evening there would be a string of visitors who would come and they would be all highly placed industrialists businessmen um, uh, people in commerce and and you know his clients and maharajas and their you know the uh, people ministers sent by them coming with gifts full of you know there, there used to be a room next to his bedroom by the end of the day that room would be full of gifts it would be fruit uh, in those days used to get fruit baskets i remember with colorful wrapping paper around it that room would be full of those baskets of fruits and flowers and gifts and pens and mementos and whatever i i mean it would just mesmerize us you know we used to have children just stand in a corner and watch this constant flow of people so in a sense it, he was of course my hero and and, and i think um, he has inspired me to a large extent to join without my again without my knowing it to join the profession and 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 learn about success oh wow that's that those are actually great great stories and and this book that you authored sounds so interesting and i i really wish we could all probably have a book for each of our families because like you rightly said it almost becomes a vibrant advertisement for future generations right to hold very close and feel very proud in terms of lineage so yeah, that's unfortunately i i published it for private circulation so it's not so many people have asked me if it's available and i have to disappoint them and say sorry but i can share it with you all if you like so we are close now after this hour of chatting <laughs> with you so i, I get you will you will give us a good copy sign copy after, the, after the interrogation i think so <laughs> 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 we will you we'll wait you'll save that one well done well done mr zarkadas <laughs> okay so you know speaking of family speaking of the personal space and i understand you also grew up in a very large family i think a 26 member family if i'm not wrong yes. yes so that's that's a lot of people that you grew up with and i'm sure you had a lot of close relationships within the family and such right but uh, as for all of us there is always adversity at some point uh, waiting to knock on our doors and we're curious to ask you did you have a particularly challenging time in your life uh, which which was really in in a sense almost uh you know sometimes it seems like how am i going to tide over this did that happen at some point to you and if it did can you share that with us it will be great to know what what may have happened and what you learned from it really uh yes i think the first thing i would like to tell everybody is that life is never a straight line and nobody nobody should ever believe that you know when you see somebody at a certain point of time in their lives 
that that's how it has been right through. In it, it can never be possible because I have a simple saying in my mind that there is no life without problems. I don't think anybody, anybody can say that I've never had problems in my life. It's just how you learn to deal with them. I think it's very important that we must learn to accept that life is going to pose problems. It's just that you must know how to deal with them. If since you asked me, did you have those moments where you felt, how will you get over it? Well, I have to say yes. And there were a few years in my life, say from the year 1990 to 1995 in particular, that five-year period was one of the most challenging, I would, I would say, uh, that I've gone through. Because uh, whereas professionally I may have been kind of, uh, you know, settling down, if I may use that expression. And sure. I thought I was kind of doing well enough. I can put it better than that. But I, I, my first wife uh, was diagnosed with cancer. So for the next three years, it was a very challenging time to first and foremost to learn to come to grips with the fact that it at the age of what I was just 45 or so, uh, I, there is a good prospect that I may lose my life, my wife and uh, the mother to my two sons. And uh, it could be, you know, it could go any which way. It, it takes at least six months or so before your mind can adjust to that uh, shocking, uh, you know, Reality. Yeah. And then as you, as your mind starts accepting it and, you know, it's like, why me? Why me? It's like, it's like a ringing bell almost right through those six months. It's, 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 you have to go through it to understand what it is because it's, you just don't know what, what it is. Why should it happen to you kind of a thing? And, and it was difficult for both of us because, uh, but she was much, much stronger than I was. And I can, but for the fact that she displayed that strength and she often probably supported, she was a greater support for me than I was to her. I may, I may be very honest about it because the first promise she took from me was that whatever happens, whatever happens, she will not let it affect my work. In other words, she will not demand from me the time or attention that I would have to give up my work to be able to be with. It, it, it is easier said than done. There were times when I, I can only give you an illustration to establish what I'm saying. There are times when she would go self-driven to, to the radiation center at Kolaba. My mother would accompany her. They would be waiting in the waiting area. She would be chatting away with all other patients, laughing, joking. And when the nurse would come, invariably she would go to my mother and say, Mem sab chalo. And she would say, Oh, hum patient. And then she would drive back on her own, self driven. So this was the kind of. Uh, you know, human being she was. That she was, the person it, she was. It, it, it made a huge difference because I could continue. I used to travel a lot for my work in those days. I could continue to travel. Never once did I feel that I was uh, not by her side. I mean, the phone was always there. And uh, only right at the end, I would say about a week or 10 days before she actually succumbed, she called up when I was in Delhi and she said, I think you better come back. And it was, it was the end. And it, 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 so, but at the same time, so that was a difficult period for me. It was very, very, uh, you know, as I said, to, to keep your balance, your mind and, and not to, you know, lose your ways. It's, it's not that easy. But then after that, you know, the challenge was, to deal with the kids because she was always there for them and I was now a single parent 
fortunately for me, I, I, I met somebody who's my present wife and uh, soon after, and then uh, we did get married. But soon thereafter, my father passed away and I was, again, quite young at that time, probably just about 50 or so. And uh, he was uh, the breadwinner. He was everything. He was my friend, philosopher, guide. He was there all the time. And suddenly to lose two people who are very dear to you in a very short span of time, it's very difficult to handle. You know, it's, it's not... And he died suddenly. There was no history. There was no illness, nothing. He just... He was in Patna for, for some case. And I get a call from the hotel where he was staying that your father had a heart attack. And I said, okay, I'm making my way there. And in 10 minutes, I get a call and said he's passed away. It was as sudden as that. So, you know, to deal with that. And in the profession which we, we are in, one thing I have learned through all these difficult times is that you cannot wear your emotions on your sleeve. You cannot afford to let the world know what you are going through. Grieving is a very private process. And it, it should, if, if you were to display even the slightest uh, sense of, you know, loss of uh, balance or strength or character or, or, or show that, you know, this has set you back, I can assure you the world will pass you by. They will do all the click clicking and cluck clucking and sympathize with you and say, oh, what a sad thing, etc. But, but there will always be somebody to replace you. So you have to, whatever it takes, that that's one thing that I've learned from this process is how to pick up the pieces. How not to, you know, show what, what is happening inside yeah. you. And, and to move on in life. And, and, you know, I think to some extent, my senior, Mr. Chagla, I have to give him credit because whenever I've had these difficult times, he and Roshan, Iqbal's wife, they have been there like a very, very firm pillar of support. And I must say they have been there not only as a support, but even as a guide that, look, you can't let this get you down, move on. You know, you come, come to court, come to chambers, cannot sit at home. Don't let it get you down. It will be okay. You will be okay. Kind of. And that makes a huge difference when there's somebody who's pushing you along. And who's got so, your back essentially, right? To that yeah. extent. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. It was extremely personal and, and also very heart-wrenching to just hear. So the thought of going through that over that five-year period is, is literally crushing. And I'm very thrilled to know that you now have found love again and uh, touch wood, you. you know, it's, it's all going very well. So that's, that's the good part, right? Thank you. Thank you. So, so we have our next question, uh, you know, again, it's, it's a little more on the EQ side than the IQ side. Uh, so we wanted to ask you, you know, with all the litigation that you've been seeing over these last almost four and a half decades, I'm sure there's some insight you get into the human psyche, uh, just human, you know, how do human beings treat conflict? Is it ego that comes into play? What really happens there? Can you, can you shed some light? You don't have to talk about a specific case, but I'm sure you've just overall seen a certain pattern in behavior, perhaps. So if you can just throw light on that. Well, um, see, there are, there are litigations and there are litigations. So, I have been on the commercial side more, uh, more often than not. Right. So, and mostly corporates. Sure. Whereas there is, say, family law litigation, where emotions take over everything, you know, and there is no balance left because the objectivity is completely gone. And that's right. why you see family court litigation is something which is, I mean, for me personally, it's very difficult to handle. Like anything to do with marriage, divorce, or even uh, guardianship or, or custody, particularly custody of children. You cannot, I mean, I, I cannot describe to you how heart-wrenching the whole process can be when, when, when human ego and human emotion make the children a kind of a tool, a bargaining tool 
you know and it, it, it is it can be a, it can be you know it shows the worst side of human character let's put it that way so those are some of the matters which i did and i have at, at great uh, you know uh, you know very reluctantly i took them up but it showed me that ultimately the failings which we have as human beings whatever we may call ourselves civilized and whatever educated or whatever you want to call yourself really nothing has changed nothing has changed and you will see it every time every day if you are in that court so that's one part of human failing human psychology and you know how it can how manipulative uh, human beings can be when it comes to uh, succeeding or wanting to succeed in their course of you know litigation right. but when you come to the commercial side or the corporate litigation side there is a greater degree of objectivity in that sense because you know you are you may be a legal head or legal or a manager but at the same time is is the corporate battle but Correct. then again what you do find is that you know within corporates also there is a lot of tussle between legal and and uh, you know the the business side and business and side, it's yeah. always you know you can you can feel it when you're in the room when you when you're taking instructions when you're dealing with a matter when you see people come to give you instructions you can see the conflicts that are going on between legal and business and again it tells you how much of the role ego has to play even in even in matters where you may not you know it may not affect you personally but it affects you personally not on the stakes but it affects you personally in your growth in, in right. the in the corporate world so you can see that actually for yourself what you also see is that another part of human feeling that you see is how clients believe and, you know there there's a myth that lawyers are liars and if you want the lawyer will tell you you know what how to you know <laughs> what he should you should say or not say well let me tell you it's exactly the other way around we try to encourage clients to speak the truth we have in in all these years i have never ever ever told a client don't say this or say this or if you say this then this will happen or if you don't say this no the rule is very simple we are sellers of or peddlers of legal solutions to existing problems it is our job to provide a solution to a legal problem the legal problem arises on the basis of a fact situation so always i always tell the client you know the facts not me please do not distort the facts if you do that you will go to jail not i i don't want you to say anything which is not correct please stick to the facts it's your affidavit it's your oath so don't try to change that and invariably what i find is clients trying to you know they think if i were to say the truth then probably you know the lawyer will think that you know i don't have a great case so they always try to hide it or say something you know which they think might go against their interest they will they come up with something they think sorry they'll sorry? come up with something will yeah, they come up they'll try to you know package it something so it's it that this is the part of human psychology that you see and the third part that you see human psychology in play is when you are before a court of law where you know you are dealing with a judge and you realize how much of the justice system as we call it is dependent so much on what the judge thinks of what is right and what is wrong and not what you think you know is the law and what the facts are so it's it's a very interesting mix you learn all this as you go along and it's a, that's why that's what makes our profession so fascinating true thank you those are three good shares so there's if i were to sum up that would you say it's ego manipulation and the third one being personal biases at some level right oh yes absolutely okay super thank you for sharing that super moving on to that like you said um like you've had many successes in the career you've had so far over four decades um you've 
uh, you've done it all. You've, you've built a great reputation. You've um, probably had a successful career as well in terms of materialism. Um, and then now at this stage, what, what motivates you at this stage to keep going and keep you know, practicing the law? Uh, I can only say one thing. Nobody can rest on their laurels. It would be the, it would be the beginning of the end if one were to do it that way. I would answer that question with a simple example. Can you go, can you expect the top notch surgeon who's about to perform a surgery after he's done say thousands of the same type to say, okay, now I've saved 2000 lives in my career. So I can take the 2001st patient easily. I mean, for that patient, that's his life. For us, as I said, every matter is as important as the last one because for us, it may be one of the many. For the client, it's the only matter. It's that fellow's matter, it's that person's case. And he comes to you because you have built a reputation. And now, at the stage at which not only me, but people in my level, at my stage, would be fighting to keep our reputation more than worry about the client's case. In that sense, the case is important to that client, but our reputation is equally important to us. So when somebody comes to us, they come to us because of the reputation which we have built over the years and it takes years and years to build and probably minutes to destroy. But it is for us to see that we provide the service which the client expects out of us and which he is looking for. So there is no question of what in that sense motivates the motivation is the very reputation that has been built over the years, which you cannot afford to let go under any circumstances. So that is very important and nobody, you can take it from me, no successful professional, no successful professional in whichever field will ever, ever practice the profession differently from what I have just told you. Mm. That, that takes a lot of toil as well, like mental toil to keep going, keep protecting your reputation, keep doing, waking up every Monday morning, you know, hitting, you know, hitting the court to keep going. So how do you manage to keep going professionally and also have a, you know, this professional and personal life balance? Well, I think my role model for that would be somebody like Roger Federer. <laughs> he is a perfect example of how to maintain a professional and personal life balance. When I read his interview and I contrasted that interview with Jokovic's interview, I mean, I'm a big fan of Federer, I realized the huge difference between the two sportsmen. Whereas Jokovic is every minute, every minute, and you can check it out on uh, um, Google or YouTube or whatever. Every minute of his day is monitored. Every minute. When he sleeps, whether he's sleeping, he's awake, whether he's eating, whether he's sleeping, whether he's practicing, whether he's playing. It is monitored. And there is a, a, a slew of professionals who are doing it. You know, whether it's heartbeat, or how much he consumes, what kind of food he eats, etc. Who he meets, where does he meet, where does he go. Federer, on the other hand, goes back to his family. He goes, crouches on his knees and plays with his children. He doesn't care a shit what's going to happen, you know, in the, on the next day or the day. He's, he'll take it as it comes. He practices. There's no question. Nobody, no professional can do without. But he's able to play when he plays or rather work when he works because for him playing tennis is work and play when he can play with his kids and family. So I think it's very important to, to maintain that balance because I had seen this one little question, if I may put it that way, that was in one of the arrow bridges of a small advertisement uh, in, a, in an arrow bridge of, an aero, of one of the airlines put up by HSBC, if I'm not mistaken. And the question was, well, it was an advertisement, but the question has remained with me. What are you working for? And I, I would 
say every one of us whichever stage we may be we should ask ourselves this question what are you working for so if you if you are working because it that's what gives you the pleasure please go ahead and do it but if if you want to work towards so you should have some goals short term goals long term goals and if you have a family and if you if you want happiness if you want to enjoy the the the, the success the fame the money then you have to make the time so the only way you can do that is if you are able to take time off and enjoy and smell the flowers and uh, you know <laughs> and not just be become a workaholic so do you you so when your work is over like do you switch off do you say like it's 7 o'clock i switched off it's now family time personal time like are you that like what fedra does do you follow that kind of mantra as well i'm sorry your the volume is not uh, i'll say not again yeah i know i I don't have as loud as voice as Tanisha, so I will speak loud. <laughs> I can do it for you, Vikas. Ah, <laughs> uh, just can you please say, do that? Uh, yeah, I was I'll saying. Um, I'll try. Uh, okay. I was saying, do you religiously kind of follow that mantra? So you finish work at whatever seven o'clock, eight o'clock, and then do you clock off and then say, right now, no disturbance. I'm with my friends or I'm with my family. Oh yeah, I mean. uh i have i have had to change over the years because there are in the beginning the demand on your time as a professional is far greater as they say love is a law is a very jealous mistress so what happens is that <laughs> in the beginning you have to have make the time for your work but it doesn't mean that you have to spend all your time there are saturdays there are sundays there are evenings and i personally feel as much as the pra- practice of law has kept me busy even in my junior days uh i find taking time away from your briefs away from reading not all the time but the time that you can spare and you and each one will require a, you know there's no one size fits all so i know how much time i require away from my work to be able to think better some people are not able to think as as well unless they are reading so i don't i don't recommend that everybody follows a strict pattern but i certainly switch off in that sense once i leave the office now when i say i switch off it doesn't necessarily mean that the mind will not you know that at the back of your mind your cases will not be kind of going around and round in your head in fact the best answers come to you when you least expect them and when your head is not buried in those papers so i would say it is actually of of great importance to know that the answers sometimes are are achieved when you give yourself time to think rather than time to study So what you're essentially saying is, uh, Deepa, ma'am, thinks you're having tea with her, or your your sons and grandchildren think you're watching a film with them. But what you're actually doing is probably thinking of that next big case and how you're going to strategize that. Is that right? No, no, no. Don't please no, ask no, no. Deepa because she will tell you that in any event, I never listen to half the things she's saying. <laughs> <laughs> see, see now that's a whole different problem we have marital counseling for that mr dwarkadas we will we will touch base with you separately okay <laughs> because that's not just your problem i think it's in every household that that, that we women feel so unheard <laughs> and no matter how much you hear us we will still feel unheard right so <laughs> we'll address that on a whole different forum another time so yes yeah. vikas moving on you have the next Super. question Yeah, I think before we move on to the next round because you know um I I it would be great for you to share you mentioned flowers in this conversation right now and then the conversation we were having a couple of days ago with you I think it would be great for the audience to also hear some of your personal passions um and also that you are a, a successful winner at growing roses as well you know in the in your past Oh I'm sorry Tanisha I, I there's something about the volume that is 
It's not, I will, I'm not able to get the question. Can somebody... I'll repeat it. I'll repeat yeah. it. Uh, yeah. I'm audible, right? Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah. You are. I'm sorry. Vikas. Uh, 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 yeah. No problem. Vikas, I'm sorry. I think there's something with the mic that is not uh, making your voice come through. Tell me, Tani. No yes. So I will repeat what Vikas said. Since you brought up flowers, right? He said, can you talk about this one time where you, I think, had a passion for growing flowers and uh -huh. how you went ahead and I think you've won, you've been a winner of of uh, a contest where you had to grow wild roses or something to that effect? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Avikas, I'm, I couldn't get the question. But yeah, I mean, look, as a child, we, we as, I, as you were told, uh, we, I grew up in a joint family. We had a family house and we had a 3,000 square foot terrace above. So, uh, you know, which was basically uh, for us to do what we like because only the family occupied the whole place. So, as a as a passion, I maybe I'm a nature lover from birth, I don't know. But I, I started growing uh, long stemmed roses and I became a member of what is called the Rose Society, which is actually based in Pune. But uh, I discovered in the process that these long stem roses in a city like Bombay, which the climate of which is completely uh, unfriendly to growing of roses required far more care and uh, involvement than one would think. So that uh, made it more challenging, if I may put it that way. And that made me kind of, you know, uh, take it up even with greater vigor. And I did participate in some contests, uh, rose shows or whatever they're called. And yes, uh, there were some prizes I had won for uh, growing those long stem uh, roses. So it's been an interesting journey for me. <laughs> this was, as, of course, as a child. Understood. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Because does that answer your question? 